My name is Andy Cahan. I'm director of author events, and I'm very honored to welcome our guest tonight. At the age of 14, John Edgar Weidman came face to face with the harrowing picture of another 14-year-old, Emmett Till, whose brutal murder the world would come to know all too well. Years later, Weidman would learn that Till's father, Louis, had been court-martialed and hanged earlier in Italy. That terrible event would paradoxically affect the verdict of the killers of Louis Till's son, and in time, prompt the creation of the book we've come to learn more about tonight. John Edgar Weidman's impressive body of work includes Philadelphia Fire, Brothers and Keepers, Father Along, and Fanon, which he presented here a mere eight years ago. He is a MacArthur Fellow and has won the Penn Faulkner Award twice, and has also been a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and National Book Award. His latest book, Writing to Save a Life, The Lewis Till File, is a braiding of fact, fiction, poetry, and memoir, a fugue of John Weidman. In, recent, in a recent piece in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, the reviewer writes, Mr. Weidman combines the official record with his own experiences and imagination to produce a discourse on truth, power, as well as the lie of race and its consequences that become a challenge to us on both sides to rise up, open the door, and see the shared humanity that some have worked so hard to disguise. Please welcome John Edgar Weidman. This is a place where I grew up, at least did part of my growing up, growing up as a teacher and as a writer and a ball player and just a person. So um, I'm a little bit uh, trembly to be back and this room is familiar to me. I've been here a number of times and I already see some familiar faces and I welcome those faces and uh, again, um, just like to say, I feel like I'm a very lucky person to be here. Um, I love to read aloud my own work. Uh, helps me when I read it aloud, it helps me understand what I'm doing. Uh, I don't do it enough anymore. Som uh, sometimes I feel a little strange doing it, but in the right mood, uh, it, it, it is very helpful to hear what, uh, where the words are taking me or, and where they take me. I think this evening that what we'll do or what uh, Andy suggested is that I will read from the book and then we can have a discussion about what I've read, and I hope you are um, full of good questions, and it'll be fun for me to, um, to hear what you have to say. This is uh, a book I've been working on, in a sense, for mm, decades. Uh, decades because when my Aunt Geraldine showed me a photo of Emmett Till, in Jet Magazine in 1955, uh, it scared the crap out of me. I didn't know what to do with it. Here was a kid my age, my color. Uh, he, he, he had taken a trip down south where my family originates. And I was full of life as full of life as any, any of us get uh, at that age, which can be pretty full of a lot of things, uh, 14 years old. But I had no idea, no understanding, really, of death. I was not a naive kid, and I lived in a segregated city and a segregated country. And my parents were responsible people, and I understood that. I wasn't a naive kid. But still, to see the horror of somebody my age who had been brutally beaten and mutilated and, and uh, his face turned almost unhuman was just too much for me. And literally, I could not look at that photo directly. I could kind of creep up on it and look at it with a kind of peripheral glance, almost like 
when kids are playing a game and they say, I dare you to do this, dare you to do this. And I, w I, did, I, couldn't, I didn't dare do it for decades. Didn't look at it hard until after the uh, civil rights documentary, Eyes on the Prize. I hope you remember that. Maybe some of you have seen it. Great, great uh, documentary. I was looking at it and remembering that moment, that moment in which I had first seen Till, and suddenly the picture came on the screen, the, the picture from Jet, and I freeze-framed my, uh, my TV and just stared at it and stared at it, kind of like a kid, again, doing something that uh, had intimidated me for ages and ages and ages. So it was a kind of freeing moment. And not all that long after that moment, when I say not all that long, maybe 10 years, um, I knew that I was still in the process of trying to remember and at the same time trying to forget the horror of Emmett Till's face. And this book is my kind of dance with those two attractions. Put it out of your head, son. Deal with it, sir. I'm going to read a section that um, takes, it, it, it commences after I had received from the archives in Virginia, the federal archives, uh, Lewis Till's service file. Uh, Lewis Till was a soldier in World War II and he had, had a file. Had a, had a, uh, and because he was tried, there is a court martial, there was a court martial in Italy and all those papers are part of his file. In fact, the other papers that uh, can you hear me? I thought someone was saying they could not hear. But uh, the, the, well, you'll hear what the file looks like. But imagine uh, a person who's been thinking about em Emmett Till and his father, Lewis, for a long time. And I sent away to this Virginia archive. And I'm not a historian. I didn't know exactly what I would get. But this, this uh, manila envelope about that size comes in the mail and I open it and I'll start there. My copy of the Till file begins with about 30 pages of miscellaneous correspondence, including notices certifying that privates Lewis N. M. I. Till and Fred A. McMurray had been charged, tried, executed, and a newspaper clipping dated October 15, 1955, reporting that Lewis Till had been hanged in 1945 for rapes and murder he committed in Italy. Then comes a long detailed narrative composed after the McMurray Till court martial by an army board of review that describes the crimes of June 27, 28 in Civita Vecchia, Italy. Death certificates of Till and McMurray follow. Next comes the initial report of alleged Sitavecchia crimes compiled by agents Herlihy and Rousseau of Criminal Investigation Division, Rome Allied Area Command, CIDRAAAC number 41, filed August 7, 1944. After snippets, snippets of administrative paperwork, Two more post-martial narratives of the crimes appear, both written like the initial narrative by army officers whose job was to determine whether or not justice had been served. All three re review board narratives tell the same story, not surprising since they all depend solely and critically on information contained in the original investigative report CID slash RAAC number 41, and testimony recorded in the court martial transcript. Three repetitions of more or less the same story, asserting violent details of who did what to whom have a chilling effect. Why would anyone reading the tale today challenge its impartiality? No doubt about it some brutal, ugly shit went down in Civita Vecchia. No counter-narratives contest the accuracy, the, verac the ver veracity 
of what review boards report. Guilt of Till and McMurray, a foregone conclusion when the court martial transcript appears at the end of the Till file. Pre-publicity with a vengeance, the court martial transcript doesn't serve the reader as an opportunity for unbiased weighing of evidence. A guilty verdict arrives as a sort of I told you so, a tail positioned in the file to wag the dog. From one review board text to the next, alleged facts pick up speed and weight become an irresistible avalanche. Review board writers adopt the omniscient view, the omniscient voice of certain kinds of fiction and nonfiction that seem to grant readers the privilege of being detached, objective observers of the action, as if a video cam hovers above scenes and characters, an objective eye and ear reporting truth and only the truth. It's a convincing account unless a reader understands that the scenarios presented by the words of review boards are not eyewitness reports of unbiased spectators present during the action, but reductions of reductions. Testimony in the Till file may seem to come from many voices, but all voices are mediated by CID RAAC agents. These agents, fellow officers of court martial judges, gather evidence, take statements from witnesses and defendants, submit their findings to the prosecution and sometimes to the defense. Conditions pertaining during the original CID interviews, interrogations, the hour of night or day, the durations, the methods and incentives employed to extract information, who was present during the questioning remain unknown unless the agent preparing the reduction chooses to include such factors. This system provides agents ample, perhaps irresistible opportunities for abuse. Limited only by conscience and ingenuity, agents can manipulate, freelance, bypass entirely words of a witness. But witness statements enter the record and are treated as if they are taped death positions, the exact words of witnesses. The only authentication required is a second sig signature beneath the signature of the officer who files the reduction. Routinely, this signature is supplied by a fellow agent. Witness statements in the file establish minute details, an intruder's exact height, and leave major issues unsettled. How many men raided the Mari residence? How many women were sexually assaulted? For army officers at court martial or serving on review boards, the cumulative weight of victim statements establish beyond a shadow of a doubt Lewis Till and Fred McMurray as perpetrators, even though each individual victim admits that darkness, hoods, masks, shock, confusion made it impossible to identify the men who attacked them. Seated across the court-martial chamber from Till and McMurray, no victim could identify or accuse either man, including Ernesto Mari, Frida Mari's father, who had claimed in a previous statement recorded by CID agents that he had seen three colored intruders outdoors in broad daylight near the cisterna, a water point in Civitavecchia, the afternoon following the night they'd raided his home and knocked him unconscious. Quote, I saw the three men, the same three, behind the house of a neighbor. I was not present, so I can't claim to know what transpired in a specific interview or sequence of interviews, but no doubt CID officers determined which words formed the final shape and meaning of testimony presented at court martial. Telltale signs of reduction are abundant in both structure and content of victim statements. In Agent Barnes' version of what Benny Lucretia and Frida Mari said to him in their second 
recorded interviews, October 28th, 1944. The last words of both statements deliver a punchline to remind the reader each woman was pregnant when assaulted. Both statements repeat identical phrases and words. Push must be one of Captain Barnes' favorite words. It appears six times in the 12 lines of one woman's statement, seven times in the other woman's. When a witness speaks to court-martial judges or to a reader of the till file, it's fair to ask whose words issue from the witness's mouth. Off-camera interrogations allow agents to plant information, coax, coax, coach, censor, coerce. The original recorded statements of Lucretia and Mari are less than 200 words each. At court martial, each woman's testimony expands to include all classic elements necessary for conviction of capital rape. Violence, coercion, duration of the act, depth of vaginal penetration, sightings of the offender's penis, assertion of the victim's resistance, the aggravating presence of deadly weapons. The fact that Till, McMurray, and other alleged perpetrators were colored, plus the fact that Till and McMurray were reported in the vicinity of Civitavecchia the night the crimes occurred, is enough to convince army officers the accused are guilty. No further burden of proof is demanded from the prosecution. Privates Till and McMurray are sentenced to death on the basis of being the wrong color in the wrong place at the wrong time. Wrong color, wrong place, wrong time, a mantra, a crime that over the course of our nation's history has transformed countless innocent people of color into guilty people. The remainder of the case against Till and McMurray consists of conflicting, ambiguous hearsay evidence that for some reason, defense lawyers, except for a few timid objections, allowed to stand. On one rare occasion when defense lawyers did challenge the prosecution's case, a defense contention that Fred McMurray's written statement naming Lewis Till as the ringleader of the fatal raid should be excluded because it was obtained by grilling McMurray for at least 10 consecutive hours, court-martial judges quickly overruled that objection. CID agents began their investigation of Anna Zanchi's murder, unaware that two Italian women had been assaulted near the Zanchi residence the same night Anna Zanchi had been shot. With no word, murder weapon recovered from the Zanchi shooting, no motive, no suspects, the investigation of Zanchi homicide was floundering and probably would have languished indefinitely unless someone stepped forward to confess or accuse. However, once CID agents heard rumors of rape by colored men, rapes occurring the night of the Zanchi shooting their murder investigation proceeded rapidly on firm footing. Rape and color paved the way, saved the day. All investigating officers needed were colored suspects, and the segregated 379th, a battalion full, was handy. Even better, agents already had in, ha had in custody a bunch of colored sugar thieves. Rape vi victims could be persuaded, unlike dead Anazanchi, to confirm the color, if not the individual faces, of assailants. Energized by rape and color, the investigation bulldozed ahead more mission than inquiry. Color and rape provided a motive, explained and linked crimes on the night of June 27 as a single predictable outburst of the well-known lust and violence that seethes barely suppressed in the blood, in the dark blood of colored soldiers. A drunken, murderous spree. A riot of uncontrollable, atavistic impulses. 
Colored soldiers whom the army considered second class citizens were suspects who possessed no rights. Investigators need respect. The logic of Southern lynch law prevailed. All colored males are guilty of desiring to w rape white women. So any colored soldier the agents hanged could not be innocent. On December 3rd, 1944, <coughs> Mrs. Joyce M.B. of Bonfire Close, charred Somerset, England, married in her ninth month of pregnancy, left her home to walk to the cinema. She was followed by Corporal Robert L. Pearson and Private Kubia Jones, both colored of Company A, 1698 Engineer Combat Battalion, United States Army. The men, strangers to Mrs. B, she said, walked up behind her, grabbed her wrists, and despite her protest that she was married and pregnant, dragged her into Bonfire Orchard and raped her. The next day in a lineup at the U.S. camp, Pearson and Jones were identified by Mrs. B, Mrs. M. B, as her assailants and arrested. At trial, Mrs. Joyce M. B testified that she begged the soldiers repeatedly, don't do it. But the men ignored her pleas. She said that during the rape, they attempted to calm and console her by saying they loved her. Corporal Pearson, 21 years old, and Private Jones, 24, dis despite their contention that Mrs. MB consented to have sex, and despite their claims of love, were both found guilty of rape and subsequently hanged at Shepton Mallet Prison, March 17, 1945, as a wave, as part of a wave of executions, including the judicial asphyxiation of Privates Till and McMurray that resulted from a directive issued by <coughs> General Eisenhower, Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in Europe and later President of the United States of America, ordering expeditious resolution of all pending cases alleging capital crimes committed by U.S. service personnel against foreign nationals. What if the crimes of June 27, 8, in Savitavecchia were not exactly rape? The criminals not exactly colored. CID agents determined to prove color and rape chose not to ask those questions. None of the obvious trails leading away from rape and color are pursued. No witness statements establishes the well-known fact elaborated by GI comments in the Till file that the assaulted shacks were situated in a cluster of hovels frequented day and night by American troops of all colors shopping for women and why. No victim statements records whether sex for money was offered, requested, expected, or obtained the night in question. Apart from accusations by the accused of other accused, no witness claims to have seen the same individuals present at both the rape and murder scenes. Only the perpetrator's color, or alleged color, links the assaults in one household with murder in another. The victims declare that fear, panic, shock, chaos couldn't diminish their ability to recognize skin color. The victims elaborate upon various shades of colored skin. They could discriminate in spite of the Stygian gloom. Statements that might impede the agent's rush to blame color and rape are adjusted. John Massey, an Italian citizen who spoke English and asserted that he could distinguish colored voices from white voices because he'd lived a dozen years in Brooklyn, New York, had sworn in an initial statement, June 30, 1944, recorded by CID agents only 48 hours after the Zanchi shooting, that one of the two masked men who had pounded on the Zanchi door demanding sex and wine was white, quote, the tall one did most of the talking. From his actions and manner of speech, 
I am of the opinion that he was white. Massey said that he had argued with two hooded armed men on the porch of the Zanchi house for several minutes before they ordered him back inside and bullets blasted through the door, killing his girlfriend's mother. A second interview, October 27, 1944, is arranged, and Massey, by then an employee of the United States military, reverses himself. Quote, the soldiers I talked to and who fired their pistols at the door of the Casa of the Zanchi family were colored Americans. In this second version of events, the version he repeated in his testimony at court martial, not only has Massey become certain that he recognized a colored man's colored voice, he swears in effect that while lying on the floor, he could see through a closed door the color of the man outside who fired fatal shots through it. How many 45s were manufactured for the US military during World War II? Lewis Till allegedly stole a 45 automatic from an American sailor on the night of June 27th and used it to kill Anazanchi. J.W. Malam, one of the killers of Lu Emmett Till, J.W. Malam's service 45 killed Lewis Till's son. Live by the 45, your son dies by the 45. Coincidence or irony or none of the above. J.W. Malam was an MP. Did he serve in Italy? Did Malam bust colored soldiers from Till's battalion? Could Till and Milam have crossed paths during the war? Could Lewis Till and Milam have crossed paths during the war? Did the same 45 kill Anazanchi and Emmett Till? What was the guilty 45's serial number? The weapon in the Zanchi shooting was identified by 45, as a 45 by shell casings on the ground at the crime scene, by holes in the Zanchi door, a big hole in the stomach of the dead woman. A 45 was never recovered by investigators. No victim identified Lewis Till as the intruder who shot Zanchi. Did the mysterious English guy, Chappie, eventually identified by CID agents as Private Frank Emanuel, 903787, 6th Battalion, Gordon Highlanders, C Company, CMF, Canadian Military Forces, borrow a 45 from Till the night of June 27th. Was the 45 in the Canadian Englishman's possession a month l later when he was shot and killed by an Italian civilian at Mienza near Terracina, Italy, during a holdup? Who was robbing whom? Did J.W. Malam sneak his army sidearm back to the States or buy a different 45 after he returned home? Who sold Malam a 45 in Mississippi? A Malam a 45 Malam liked to show off to his sharecroppers, people say. A war souvenir he shoved into Emmett Till's ear to scare him, smashed across Till's skull when Emmett didn't seem scared enough, pulled the trigger and blew out the boy's brains when scaring wasn't good enough. Was the English sounding guy a colored gay guy hanging around AWOL in a U.S. Army colored barracks with Lewis Till, Fred McMurray, and Junior Thomas. Was this Chappie, as he was known, because he called everybody else Chappie, fucking Junior Thomas on the sly? Did Thomas, with his gay lover, the foreign soldier, hustle and rob gay soldiers, gay sailors? Is that how the Zanchi murder weapon was obtained? After the Mari Bar barracks attack, did Chappie and Thomas, not Till and McMurray, raid the Zanchi shack? Did Chappie or Thomas shoot a 45 through the closed door? The plot thickens. What if a person, what if the person who prepared the Till file to be read by others had decided not only that Lewis Till's voice must be heard, but that it must be heard first. What if a reader of the Till file
could enter its pages without being assaulted by the same unforgiving tale repeated by three review boards. What if the voices of Till's wife, Mamie Till, or Till's son, Emmett, or a buddy of Lewis Till from the 379th Port Battalion, a colored GI not on trial for murder, were included in the file? What if the file included the hurry-up memo from General Eisenhower ordering expeditious completion of all capital court-martials in Europe? Or included statistics documenting the stunningly disproportionate number of colored soldiers accused, convicted, and executed for rape? Or included the fact that systematic discrimination limited the number of colored soldiers in the officer corps, and thus very few were available to staff court-martials and review boards? Voices recorded in the file have been orchestrated to engage in a conversation solely among themselves, a conversation condemning Till by excluding his voice, a conversation not acknowledging, let alone pondering, the meaning of Lewis Till's silence. Lewis Till, an orphan in his file, just as he'd started life as an orphan in New Madrid, Missouri. Guilty of being nobody long before a court martial tries and convicts him, delivers his death sentence. He is born a colored orphan and he dies one. A nobody, no voice, no room for Till inside or outside the file's pages. Till doomed by cracks within cracks within the legal system, cracks in the yellow-gray transcript, the file's stuttering helter-skelter chronology avoids and silences Lewis Till, a file already contaminated, problematic, once Lewis Till's right of confidentiality scratched off the cover after the document was legally sealed in 19. 45. Everybody in the Till file lies. It's easy to recognize situations that compel lies. Benny Lucretia's desperate concern to protect her daughter Elena's honor and marriageability. Fred McMurray's last ditch attempt to keep his neck out of a noose. Junior Thomas blames others to exonerate himself. CID agents desire to construct an open and shut case to meet a superior officer's demand for swift justice. If a reward is enticing enough, does the temptation to lie become irresistible? Do extreme circumstances mitigate lies? Do all questions deserve true answers? Is that boy from Chicago in there? Are you hiding Jews in your cellar, Tutsis in your attic? It's not easy for a reader of the file to figure out if a false story is being told because the teller believes it's true, or to figure out if a story is suppressed because the person not telling it believes it's false. When is silence a lie? Can silence protect truth? from the contamination of lies. It's exceedingly difficult to figure the how and why of lies, difficult to accept that a tangle of self-interested deceptions is as close to truth as anybody ever gets. Where does one lie end and another lie start? Each party has heavily invested in his or her portion of lies. In the file, until a court-martial passes judgment and decides which version of events wins, all lies are equal. All lies except colored lies. Colored lies, or truth, or fiction, are invalid unless they substantiate white lies. Lying is a weapon nobody in the Till file can afford to surrender. The collective enterprise of lying creates a sort of stock market. 
a Ponzi scheme, a market trading solely in worthless commodities. The only value and appeal of the stocks is that they postpone temporarily a reckoning of their worthlessness. They can be bought and sold and profit accrued as long as someone listens to the lie or believes the lie or pretends to believe the lie. Ensconced in a make-believe kingdom like Prospero's enchanted island in the tempest, stocks are granted substance, habitation, names. Nobody invested in this chimerical market wants it to crash because their profitable lies will come tumbling down with the rest. The players wheel and deal as if the web of lies will never unravel, never unwind or wind down or wind up or do whatever lies do, whatever stocks do, lives do, fictions do when the game's over. Like everybody else, I'm invested in my own little portfolio of lies set aside for rainy days. My lies true as any others till Prospero snaps his magic wand. Will a moment finally emerge in which a collection of lies offers access to truth? More truth anyway than a single ind individual, liar, or honest person is capable of reconstructing. Which lies? Whose lies? The file writes fiction. To mimic reality, the till file writes fiction. I, I think that's, that's a, a good place to stop. Okay, I read the article in Esquire magazine. And I was very moved by it. I asked um, Viet a Vietnam veteran, a Korean veteran, and a school teacher of history. They never heard this. So how do we keep this so quiet? How did that happen? Hmm. Do you hear me? Oh, yes, I heard you. <laughs> I heard you. Well, I think number one, I like the word we because uh, it's an American dirty secret and we're all Americans. And we have the very last bit I was reading about a network of lies and self-supportive lies and a, and a kind of um, investment in it. I'm afraid that uh, I believe that about history and certainly about the history of uh, African-American people in the New World, in Europe and in America. And so your question is the one that we have to yell from the rooftops. Well, first of all, it has to reverberate inside of us because we're all complicit. We're all complicit. Uh, the United States Army, veterans, the country owes an awful lot to you, to those folks. Uh, what it pays back is often a large amount of hypocrisy. And we seldom go back to first principles. Now this is, I'm taking a big leap now, but armies, killing, conflict, nationalism, is what we have worth killing other people, arming ourselves to kill other people. That's why I'm saying you've got to go back to the individual. What kind of lives do we want to lead? How, how, how willing are we to put our lives in other people's hands? And what, where, does that, where does conflict, where does war, nationally organized armed conflict fit into all of this. And I don't think I'm getting away from the question of till and the question of the dirty secret that America has about its armed service. I mean, I'm just trying to make that question reverberate. It's a big question. 
It's the question of, you know, survival. And we certainly need to be thinking about that at this moment. Thank you. As a veteran, as a Vietnam veteran, um, I'm certainly um, understand about the racism inside the United States Army. Um, and like most people were not aware, and I was not aware of this until you read what you read tonight. But during World War II, the United States Army went to war against itself in Brisbane, Australia, and uh, hundreds were killed on both sides, black soldiers fighting white soldiers. And uh, the late writer John Oliver Killens outlines that in his novel, And Then We Heard the Thunder. So that's another secret that probably most of you don't know, that the United States Army went to war with itself, black against white. The same thing happened in Vietnam in a place called Chu Lai. Thank you for your work, John. Well, you know, we don't, we don't, and good to see you, and uh, thanks for coming out. It's been a while. And hail Pittsburgh. <laughs> um, the Army went to war against itself in the United States, in Brownsville, Texas. Uh, large numbers of people were, were killed. And, and in a sense, the riots had occurred both post-World War I and World War II uh, in many large cities in this country had at their roots a kind of, well, yeah, you were over there and you were, on, you were soldiers and we gave you guns, some of you guns, most of you we gave shovels and uh, picks, but uh, don't get uppity. We, uh, we want to make sure that that experience of being a soldier did not make you too aggressive, and so there were riots. There were soldiers who uh, got in, into some fight or got sh shot by the police or just attacked. And this occurred in, in large numbers and caused some of our cities to burn uh, in, in that kind of ritual that, that seems to happen every uh, 30 or 40 years. So the incidents that my colleague uh, uh, noted are not rare. Uh, the till, I didn't, as I said at the beginning of my talk, I didn't know about till for a long time. I didn't know about him for a long time. And the only reason I found out about him uh, is because I read something, not by a black scholar, but by a woman named Alice Kaplan, who had decided to write a book about another American soldier who uh, seemed to get a really, the, the, the a miscarriage of justice and was executed. In fact, he's buried in the same cemetery as Lewis Till. And this man um, happened to have as his uh, lawyer an, uh, a, a, uh, a Frenchman. And that Frenchman turned out to write novels. And Alice Kaplan, being a literary scholar, kind of wrote a book that, that talked about her uh, her, her biography of this French writer and talked about the French writer who uh, work as a translator in the cases in the, in the courtroom for many, many uh, black GIs during World War II. And Alice Kaplan wrote about a visit uh, to, the, to her subject. Um, his name was, begins with an M, I'm sorry. I, I can't think of it right now, but her subject, one of her subjects, one of her, one of her subjects was um, the French novelist, the other was the African-American soldier who was uh, killed by the military. And she went to a cemetery to visit those graves. It just happened. She knew she happened to pass the grave of, of uh, Louis Till and noted it in her book. And that's the first time I had read of, uh, of that grave. And of course, sent a shock through me. And a double kind of shock. And this goes back to your very good question. Because then I said, well, why didn't I, as, as, as traumatic as my experience was with Emmett, why didn't I ask myself questions about Emmett's family? Why, why was his father invisible to me, another young black man, until that moment? And I think that I felt guilty about that kind of uh, lack of interest, that lack of 
uh, 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 drive to find out more, and the lack of my uh, acuity to see that African American males are not lone wolves, but members of a culture, a family, uh, an extended network. I think we buy, for lots of uh, bad reasons, the notion that uh, African-American men and women are orphans. We buy this notion because our idea of father, our collective idea, our European-American, starts with a patriarchal white figure with a beard, who some people call God. And then in this descending hierarchy of being, there are other males, and one of them might be your father because he's the patriarch of the family. And the whole, the whole thing is held together by this sort of structure of powerful men who have authority over others, women, children, et cetera, et cetera, corporations, et cetera, et cetera. And we believe that. It's deeply ingrained in us. We think of that. We think of that's the formula for culture. That's a formula for order. That's a formula to organize things, to have control of our lives. And if you have a white father, very up there at the top, where do these black kids come from? Well, you know, who, do I, I, I can't have a father. I, I must be an orphan. Where are the missing Lewis Tills? And I, that kind of thinking is so deeply ingrained and so symbolic and mythical that we're not aware of it. We carry it around. But it comes out. Uh, it comes out when there's a tragedy. It comes out uh, when someone pointed out to me just the other day that when uh, Ms. Clinton gathered all the uh, uh, mothers of the young men who had been shot down like flies over the country in the past, the previous nine months, all the names that are sort of embedded in the newspaper, it was women on the stage. Why, w where were the men, where were the fathers? Did these men who were shot down have fathers? Did Michael Brown have a father? And where does he fit in the picture? Or is that a picture we just don't choose to look at? So the Till file is still being written. The methods, the framework, still I being I didn't written. know either, which surprised me. Uh, but um, I, I, I really did like the book, but I was totally bowled over when you got to Ezra Pound and started uh, quoting from the cantos. Huh. Was, was Emmett Till, was that from the cantos? I never read it. I know I've been to the Bodleian and I should have read Ezra Pound. But you have a section in there about Ezra Pound and I think you said that he was in a prison next to the colored prisoners. And then you have a section in fr from the cantos where he says something about Till being hanged. That just blew me away. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Ezra Pound was held in the same prison as Lewis Till during World War II. And uh, Pound was this close to being sentenced to death for being a traitor. He, he made announce, he, he lived in Italy and he, he uh, was a, st a student of, of Italian culture and uh, particularly um, uh, Provencal lyrics. He loved them. And, uh, well, Pound knew a little bit of everything about all, all poetry. But they were, they were literally in the same hokey, <laughs> in the same jail, uh, as strange as it may seem. And that's the fun of writing a book, for me. You never know what you're going to find. You never know what you're gonna, wh what's going to turn up. And I, I met the guy, who, who, uh, a scholar, a man. Uh, I met the man who preserved that material and who for first wrote about it. He happened to live not very far from me in New York City. He was a teacher, a professor at uh, NYU. And we exchanged uh, stories, et cetera, et cetera. And he's written about that relationship. Um, but yes, in, one, in the Pound Cantos, there are references, direct references. His name, Lewis Till's name, is in, uh, in the Cantos. And I've quoted some of the lines in, in the book. So it's just very, uh, very, very peculiar, this world 
we've made for ourselves in the past 400 years. So Pound ended up in an asylum and Till ended up executed. Do mm. we know how many others were executed in, uh, for rape during that period? What a statistic I can give you is that uh, Till was buried in a segregated uh, graveyard, cemetery in France. There's a huge uh, American memorial cemetery that has uh, 3,000 bodies in it. No, excuse me, 6,000 people who were killed in World War I. And then if you cross the road, there's another kind of, there's an administration building for that big cemetery. And the big cemetery is beautiful. Uh, a Carrera mar marble cross, if, if a cemetery, if a war memorial can be beautiful. It's spooky to think that we can be talked into believing it can be beautiful, but leave all that. Uh, across the road is this uh, administration building. If you go out of the back door of the administration building, secluded in in a, uh, in a, in a co uh, of, of uh, pine trees and uh, uh, adders, you, you will find this thing called the dishonorable, rest, dishonorable graveyard. And there are 97 men buried there, and 83 of them are African American. And those are, those are men who the United States Army uh, executed. They're not all there for rape. Some are there for shooting officers, some are there for just murdering civilians, but the 90 odd and 80 odd uh, are African American, and one Native American and one Mexican. Uh, so that's a partial answer to your, to your question. The dishonorable resting place. Uh, hi, uh, I'm a history teacher and an aspiring writer, and um, what struck me about the piece that you read is that your willingness to work with questions that don't have answers, and I find that in our days, especially in this age of information, there's a lot of people walking around wanting to be experts. Um, and wanting to claim to know the answer to things. And so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you make peace with that, with writing questions and leaving them unanswered and, and how you use those. Thank you. I'm a, I'm a great reader. I read lots and lots and lots, and I almost make it a pact with myself that if I start something, I finish it. I may not finish it with a lot of attention, but I, I do, I like to give the reader the benefit of the doubt because some things I've not been able to penetrate turn out to be on second try or third try or a couple years later, some of my very favorite books. But anyway, given that, uh, one thing that will turn me off and make me start skipping pages and moving through the pages very quickly as if, the, the, as if the writer doesn't have any questions, if there are not questions embodied in the text. If the writer has, seen, has everything sort of figured out and just delivering me, delivering to me, the reader, uh, the, the results of his already pre-digested information and ideas, uh, then what's the point of reading? What's the point, why am I spending my time with this? Uh, everything's already been figured out. Er, the, the, the end is in the beginning, and et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's not why I write. I write to try to discover things. I write when, that, when something is mysterious to me. I write when it, when it scares me. And that's the motivation I have. That's what makes me get up and uh, go at it every day, every morning. And I find that the more I write, the... Um, like discovering a till, a Lewis till, like discovering a till and a pound in the same jail. And they probably talk to, they probably talk to each other. And uh, all sorts of things like that. But, but not just information, not, you know, because that almost gets back to the sort of dead end of knowledge for knowledge's sake or uh, how many X's does it take to make a Y? Uh, if there's an answer to that question, well then, you know, put it in a, 
place where people can go get it if they want to, but, it, but it's not a very interesting question anymore, is it? It's tamed. It's not about the unknown. It's not about the possible. It doesn't change our lives. So that's my, um, uh, my take on the kind of information explosion. But not only facts, but one thing I discovered as I tried to write this till book is that I had to talk, I had to rethink my father. And the more I thought about Lewis Till, the more I was reminded of my father and vice versa. And of course, they're very different men and uh, as far as I'm, and uh, my father was a, a good father in a sense. He was around my whole life. Um, Lewis Till was not around for Emmett. But we, there were parallels. There are insights. There are things that I'm, I learned about my relationship with my family and particularly my father through writing this book. I haven't read the book yet, but I was curious what are some of the threads or links that you make between the murder of Emmett, uh, of, of uh, the father and the murder of the son? I think what bothers me about it is that neither, the, the, the most profound link is that neither man had a chance. And that they both died very young. Uh, and there seems to be a kind of inevitability in both deaths. Uh, not an inevitability that comes from some sort of, from the outer space or some eminent, uh, some, some uh, knowledge or God or uh, necessity cause, but the shortcomings of the way we treat one another in this country. The lies or the lie of race, the, the history that we choose to pretend characterizes our past, our own lives. Uh, so the inevitability and the helplessness of those two men and the loss, that's what connects them as well. I mean, Lewis Till might have been a bum. He might have been a counselor. He might have gone to prison in the States. Who knows? He might have come back. He may have fallen in love with his son all over again and Amy all. We don't know. And we certainly don't know what would have happened to that 14-year-old kid who was naive and happy and happy-go-lucky and who had had a, a real tough life as a youngster. He had, he had kind of polio, some sort of reaction to a shot. And he, he got himself, he, was, he loved baseball, but he couldn't run, limp. But he, he, was, he was full of life, full of energy. And so what finally connects them for me is the sense of loss. How much we how much we waste of ourselves and the fact that in the selfish sense when we waste our people when we waste our children uh, we are uh, diminishing ourselves thank you